Okay, it's going to be a bit blank in there. Okay, in lecture two, there's a couple of base ideas without strumming that you need to get through. Right? First one, and they're all ideas Einstein developed as part of this special relativity and came up as uh, part of that famous 1904 paper. Funny enough, it wasn't actually this paper which got him his Nobel Prize, by the way. Uh, he got two Nobel Prizes explaining the photoelectric effect and for his um, second one which was his um, general relativity paper okay now the cup a couple of concepts you guys need to know about there it's going to work that's good I can get rid of that the first one and I will do some other notes around this so you don't have to worry so much the first one is this idea of rest mass. This is a concept you do need to know. The rest mass is simply the mass of an object when it is at rest in the frame you're in. Um, and that is imp an important concept because of another thing that comes up a little bit later. Now, uh, of course, the mass of an object will do what as you increase its speed into relativistic speeds? It gets greater. So when you talk about relativistic speeds, the three things we notice is that mass increases, time slows, and length shortens or decreases. Okay, so the three things are relativistic speed. That's right. The second thing he then said, which is really important, is something called the energy mass equivalence. That's the one. So that, what he essentially said is that, not that you can get energy from mass, that's not what it actually means, although that's an implication of this. It means that mass and energy are equivalent things. They're just different ways of expressing exactly the same stuff. So that when you get a conversion in a nuclear reaction of matter into energy, you're not creating new stuff there, you're just converting it from one form to another. Is that also why um, gravity sort of acts on energy too, sort of light and stuff? Well, light has mass, which is why... Gra why um, gravity acts on it. But if light has mass, then why can't have a look at speed to count? Um, because it does. I mean, there's some things in the universe we can't explain yet. Okay. But the, tr uh, the truth is that photons, which you'll learn about in ideas to implementation, particles that make up light, remember light's a wave as far as we're concerned so far, that's classic physics. New physics is light is made up of photons. These photons only exist while they're in motion. So we learn when we're learning classical physics, we're learning pre-1900s physics largely, and it works. Not um, anything from Newton and Galileo, those guys, and Kepler, it all works pretty well while you're travelling at fairly low speeds. But the moment you either get into very small um, particles or you get to very large and very fast particles, then our models from Newton and whatnot start to have errors in them. They start to fall to bits a bit, a little. And it's guys like Niels Bohr and Einstein and those other guys have developed these models further to take into account those other things. Okay? So Newton's using using Newton to work out your mechanics on a bridge is pretty good. You don't need the Einsteinian why stuff necessarily. Because as we said, um, because the universe seems to be based upon the speed of light and everything is, um, the way things are shaped and structured seems to depend upon your relative velocities. Um, when you're at slow velocity, well then everything just seems to stay the same, fits well, but it's only because when you get into these far end things we have to change our models. And why does it look weird to us? If we lived our lives travelling at the speed of light, 
then all our theories would have been based around that, wouldn't it? And then the slow things would have seemed strange to us. It's that we regard normal as the conditions we live in. And then the strange stuff is the stuff that we don't typically see. We don't see um, sub, sub molecular things. So that looks weird to us as we try to work out how it works. And the same with the high speed stuff. The thing about this is energy and mass are equivalent, but it was the formula we learned in ideas to implementation, which led to, um, gave the theoretical basis for doing the conversion of mass to energy in destructive weapons like nuclear weapons. Okay. So that's, that's basically saying because the speed of light is so big that the equivalent of energy in anything is uh, huge, very large. So a kilogram of um, fissionable material, if it's all converted 100% into, well, it's nine times 10 to the 16 joules of energy. That's a lot. That's a lot. So you don't need a lot of matter to create um, to so convert to a lot of energy. Of well, we already do harness it in some ways, but fusion is uh, a future technology which will be better for us for various reasons, such as if you fuse hydrogen together, you get helium. You don't end, not um, whereas if you use fission, you end up with all these radioactive by byproducts, which are nasty. So fusion is a number. So. That's the mass energy equivalency. And the mass that you use for that is typically called the rest mass. That's why I use that thing up there. So it's the mass of the object at rest which gives us the energy that it will give off. Okay. And sometimes they denote that as MA. So it's the they typically use this formula with the rest mass. Now if you want to cause a big argument amongst physicists, go and ask them what mass is. And after about two weeks of argument, they'll all agree they don't really know. What is this? It's stuff. No, but they argue about it. It's like, if you really want to cause another argument, when they're finished arguing about maths, ask them to describe energy. So now then you'll see them at each other's throats. So the only thing they know in that formula is the speed of light. <laughs> to some degree of accuracy. We know it works, and we know that we can do stuff with it, but if you ask them what energy is, whether it's a property of a, an object or whether it's an accounting number which it's tells something. us something about it. It is something. And oh, physicists okay. fundamentally disagree with each other and get very angry about it when they, they disagree just, about it. Why don't they just figure it out? No, no Vsauce needs to bring out If you go and find out, no, if you go and do research and actually definitively work out what energy is, you go and get yourself a Nobel Prize for the job. Okay. Next thing. <laughs> Absolutely, there's never an answer. Um, twin paradox, that's the one I've explained to you before, which is of course the time dilation. If you, and I've talked about it, if you throw a, tw a twin into a, one twin into a spacecraft and it goes off to Alpha Centauri and back, travelling, you know, near the speed of light, when they get back, they will be younger than the twin that stayed on Earth. So do you mean physically younger? Yes. Like Such as, the, um, if they leave when they're both 21, and the other one will come back and be um, 23 years and 8 months, and the other one will be 26 and 9 months old. Like and their molecular... On, on their clock, as they go away, you will say they're going to be in space. No, no, the clock will be, the 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 clock will be exactly the same. They, just, they won't know until they get back that they're different ages. That's right. All that the well, times were different. Now, what they know? So they went really far away, and they went to like the next galaxy and back, and they came back to the other Yes. But even at the speed of light, you're not going to get to the next galaxy and back. They'd come yeah. back and it'd be like one of their birthdays. And... Yes. If they both have watches, then the watches would be different. If you could look at each other's watch on a, some sort of screen, yeah. you'd see that their t times are travelling at different times. But all their molecular... Like on a screen, wouldn't their times be the same? Because if you're getting a signal, then the signal travels at the speed of light, which means... Yes, you're coming to another question which was raised, which is about precession. Because like, if I, say, Skype the person in the spacecraft, because it's travelling at the speed of light, it's... Uh, Near the well, speed of light. Because it, it takes like eight minutes to travel from the sun, yeah. so... That's university level. I don't. We don't have to do that now. There are all sorts of extra stuff in this which go with that. But um, as far as their body's concerned, 
if they had four, depending on their speed and how long they're gone, the person on the spaceship might have four birthdays, so four calendar years tick off, that's fine. Person on Earth, look at their watch, they might have nine, nine birthdays go past. Both will feel that they're both right. When they arrive back, this person's five years younger than their twin. And the other thing I didn't understand in that whole conversation, first you said, no, just watch one different for the same time. And then... To him. So the person on Earth will look at their watch and will kid go normally. They won't discern any difference. But the person in the spaceship, his watch will look perfectly normal and will appear to go at exactly the same time. But when they arrive back and compare their watches, they'll be travelling at different right. rates. So if we're going to compare watches, aren't going to run around this class? Not fast enough. You have to go near the speed of light, Jack. Okay? Oh, pretty fast. Number four. Spelled incorrectly, but it doesn't matter. Simultaneity is the next thing you need to know about very briefly. Right? Simultaneity basically says you don't know if two events happen at the same time. Well, the reason you don't know this is quite a simple explanation. <clears throat> okay. Um, imagine, if you will, uh, a very simple illustration where you have a person standing on a platform... listening and then he has two speakers sitting either side at the same distance in the same conditions and he has a button he presses the button and the sound waves travel through the distance to his ears and what will you hear they should arrive at exactly the same time right okay but if he then did a similar experiment where he had the standing speaker there but he had someone on a train coming at a certain speed with a speaker in it. So the speed's, the train's going that way. It will increase the speed of the sound wave, won't it? So what, what could happen is if the train's far enough back when he pushes the button, that sound wave... I'm giving the wrong illustration here. They could occur at the simultaneous, simultaneously and arrive at the same time with him, couldn't they, if that train was further back because of the increased speed of the wave? Yeah, you get a picture of that? Or, I'm trying to think how to illustrate this, I got myself slightly mixed up with it. If something Yeah, if something occurred, um, if someone started the sound, um, a sound a long way back and as it came past another point, someone let off another sound, they could both arrive at the observer at the same time, couldn't they, those sound waves? And so even though they would appear to be simultaneous sounds to the person who heard them, they would not necessarily have occurred at the same time. Okay, so I start a sound wave, it starts coming in. As it passes a point, someone else lets off another sound wave and both sound waves travel at the same time to the observer. It, and it could sound like the same, that the two sound waves are created at the same time, but they're not. They're not simultaneous. Now, one of the things that um, comes up in Einstein's thoughts is quite simply, is because of relative motion of frames and things, you, can, you can't tell without doing some maths and having other information whether or not an event is simultaneous. Right? It may or may not be. Just because it appears to be simultaneous doesn't guarantee that it is. Or um, just because two things, uh, two lots of light arrive to you at different times doesn't mean they didn't occur at the same time. Well, yeah, but for example, say I have a star back here and a star down here, and they both explode at the same time. Won't get light won't get you at the same time. So you can't tell just by observation like that if they're simultaneous events. <coughs> so simultaneity is something that comes from relativity. You have to take that into account. You've got to have some additional information to know what's going on here. And that's the very, very simple basis of that. Okay. So there's those, there's the four big concepts which the syllabus wants you to just know and understand. And they come up in Einstein light and they come up in those um, in the readings I'll give you. But the actual concepts are not superly taxing. Okay? Right. 
And um, tomorrow I might give the notes to those. Today what I'll do is I'll just make sure that we have the other thing in hand, which is those questions. That's when you do the Einstein light work here tomorrow. I didn't book them this morning because You can. All right. So there's readings there, the scripture and simultaneity, reading on simultaneity, and then we've got the time dilation and all these things here, mass and energy. So all those readings are in Moodle if you want them, but I will give you another copy of stuff. What I want to do just now, because I know some people are stressing about this, is to look at these questions. Now we did one yesterday, but because the audio is horrible on it, I'll do another one to couple today. Okay. I oh, don't do that, you silly machine. I just don't want it to. About there, that's all right. Mm. All right. First thing to know is what is the formula that we're going to use to sort this thing out. So what formula are we going to use for this? Well, we're doing time. Which one is TV, which is the observer not moving relative to the frame. We're going to look at the question in a minute. The formula you're going to use for all these is the same formula. It's got TV equals... No, we're doing the time one. Is it divided by or is it multiplied by? Now this form in this thing, Riley, if it's the same for every single one of them, it's square root of 1 minus v squared on c squared, okay? Now, just as a hint for you, if you happen to be doing a, a question on time and you compare the time of the stationary observer compared to the time of the person in the spaceship which one should be the smaller that's right so if you end up with that being the wrong way around if you end up with that that one being smaller you know you've multiplied instead of divided or whatever you got the numbers the wrong way around so just swap them over with length what should it be smaller in the spaceship or larger smaller so again if you, get the, if you get an answer which says that that is larger than that, you know you've gone wrong with your formula, just swap it around. What if, what if and O stand for that, That's the observer that's stationary, that's the observer which, well, they actually have observer um, co-moving with it, that's why I say O, and V, I don't know, it's just traditional textbooks we use, I can't remember. Alright, so got that. Let's have a look at... Uh, a question here about num number six about the Klingon captain. Every um, physics person, of course, is um, a Star Trek nerd. So, <coughs> the Klingon captain notes that it takes 0.5 seconds to fly past the stationary Enterprise. So, which one is in oh, motion? Please. Which one's in motion? The Cleons. So they they take, they are co-moving. It takes a 0.5 seconds to fly past a stationary Enterprise spaceship. They're travelling at a velocity of 0.1 c. Yep, 0.1 is the speed of light, which if you translate it is going to be 0.3 times 10 to the 8 metres per second. And they're asked, you're asked to find out how long does it look like for Captain Kirk to Captain Kirk on the Enterprise as they go past. So it must be a very big spaceship, the Enterprise, for it to take 0.5 of a second of that speed to go past him. But anyway, so 
what we of course do is we put our formula up, hoping we've got it the right way around. We'll see in a minute if we have. What's the next step, Brad? Put the data in. So we don't know TV, we do know T naught, which is 0 0.5 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.3 times 10 to the 8 squared. All over 9 times 10 to the 16. I'll bring my calculator up so you guys can actually see the calculation here. The first thing I'm going to do, hey, 0.3 x to the 8, and that has to be squared, which it is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that by the 9 x to the 16, 0.01, which means that 1 minus that. That's simple enough to work out, 0.99, square root of that answer. Now, on this particular um, calculator, I have cube root there. And I have any root there, but I don't actually have square root on this calculator, I can see. So, So, what you do... It's x to the y, 0.5. That's the answer. Or you could just hit um, y to the root x, type in 2 for y. So I could. And then up here, on the minus. Oh, it's up there, I didn't see it. Anyway, that's what that is. So I'm going to divide that, divide 0.5 by that. So I'm just going to put it into memory. No. 0.5 0.503 Okay, so that's how you do that. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Okay, so we'll do another one. Everyone's comfortable and happy with that? Yes. A UFO? Let's do number eight, shall we? Actually, no, let's not do that. Let's do the Alpha Centauri question. That's quite um, a typical one. All right, let's put our, let's do what we always do. You put your data in, yep. Yep. So my data in this case for number nine about Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is 4.0 light years from Earth. Imagine a spaceship is able to fly at 0.9 C. So that's the velocity of that spaceship. Um, how long would it take to get the reserve by the pilot on Earth? So you want to know time, sorry, and by mission control. So you want to know about TV and TO. So I haven't given you all the information here to be able to use the formula, have they? The first thing you need to work out is the time on Earth. 20% of the speed of light. Yep. Well, if you're travelling at the speed of light, it takes 4.5 years to get there, right? And then you're going to have to come back again. So. So it'll take you nine years to do the return journey if you're going at the speed of light. No, 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 you do need to know that. Because first thing, our story is 4.5 years from the Earth. Imagine the spaceship able to fly at that speed. How long would it take, take to get there? Oh, it is get there, sorry. Not return. I thought it was both ways. Now, you're going to get... No, no. 
Why wouldn't it be? Because if it take if one, if you're travelling at the speed of light, it takes four point five years. Yeah. If you're travelling at point nine of that speed, nine tenths of that speed, yeah. it's so, going to take you longer. So point uh, so four point five or something like one point one. Right. So what it's going to be? Sir, how would you make the U turn at nine percent of the speed of light? You stop the turn. You have to slow down. You can't just do it. Overshot it by a couple of meters. <laughs> It's going to take you five years. Hmm. So at point nine, well, the way I do it, guys, so that you get it, Tom. Thank you. It, hmm? The simplest way to do it is you're traveling at nine tenths of speed of light, right? So you just invert that and multiply it out, so you end up with 45 over 9, which will give you 5 years. See the logic? Hmm? Yep. So that's the easy way to sort that one out. So now you know that the person on Earth will see it takes 5 years. How long is it going to take the person in the spaceship, according to their watch, to do it? So what we've got is the TV equals T naught divided by the square root. And we always write our formula in. The reason you write your formula in, guys, is when you're doing your exam, if you get the correct formula and you do a dodgy substitution to work it out, you still get marks. If you just start putting numbers randomly in, they don't know what you're doing, you, you won't get it. They prefer you to write in the numbers before you rearrange. 5 equals T naught divided by the square root of 1 minus um, 0 0.9 times 3 times 10 to the 8 squared and all that is over 9 times 10 to the 16 okay so all I do now is I take this part here and multiply it by 5 so t naught is going to equal 5 outside the square root of 1 minus 0.9 times 3 times 10 to the 8 squared all over 9 times 10 to the 16. Now if I do that as a calculation I'm going to end up with 0.9 times 3 x to the 8 that's not right That's squared, divided by 9 x to the 16, so 0.81, so it's 1 minus 0.81. Oh, yeah. oh, Square root of that. Times 5. So the answer is... lost my power for a minute. So the answer is... Give me red. So that speed, it appears to the person on the spaceship to take less than half the time than it took the person on Earth. So even though they, yes, yeah, so even though you see on Earth and it took them five years to get out to the star. The person on the spaceship thought it only took 2.17 years. Because uh, hmm. time travels slower in the spaceship. <laughs> so. With that being said, if it takes um, light 10 years to get from a star to a place, from the light point of, say you, say you were a cowboy riding a photon, yeah. how long would that... Like, how, how, how long would that take you? Would it be shorter? Like shorter? Yes, it would be a lot shorter. So, 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 so what, uh, would, you, would you take five years of flight, or would you take ten years of flight, or would you take four years of flight?
Well, you'd, actually, you want to take a little bit extra because it's 2.17, which means it's 2.34. So, um, 4. Point, yeah, you'd want to take 4.5. You're not just going to go there for the chip. You're going to go there to study stuff. It's, uh, mm. it's, it's like, you know how fast you get more mass increase. It seems like the more mass, it actually flips space time. So it's kind of that's, no, that's not the explanation they have, no. It's like travelling around the outside of the black hole. Because the black hole is so massive. It stretches space time. That's right, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't understand. It's an interesting thought, actually. But no, that's the not typical. You go, the more your mass yes, and that's one of the big problems, isn't it? Trying to keep it accelerating. Okay, guys, do we need me to do any more of those problems? Because they are really quite straightforward. It's what um, one physicist I know calls plug and chug maths. Because there's a formula, you take your data, you put it in there, you press your calculator, and numbers come out the other end. Okay? It's not superly difficult. So, what I'm requiring of you guys from here, I'll give you a, um, tomorrow to do some of this work in class, then it's up to you. Okay? So um, it'd be really a good idea, particularly guys at the back, to what, go through the Einstein light, just read it, look at the video clips, the animations, all that. Right. It will give you a deep understanding of it. You're not here tomorrow? No, no, I'm here. Right. But I'm going to give you tomorrow in class to do that so that you ha um, have some class time to cover the content. You can also do more of these questions because these are all in Moodle. So they're there for you to do. You don't need to because I've done it. <laughs> yes, I will give you, I will also give you some small summary notes tomorrow just in the Google Docs. I'll just write a very short summary up about the five main points there. But as you can see, even though this um, people talk about this being the hard stuff, the, the way this sort of structure, you need to know about five, understand five ideas. You need to understand how we got here from Nichols and Morley, and you need to be able to do a bit of maths. Um, and even if you don't, can't do anything else like that, like if you don't know why it works and it seems strange to you, uh, the good thing about the HSC is you're actually not required to understand it. You're just required to get the right answers at the other end. And, and as I was saying to Marnie yesterday, in, in many ways, the projectiles was actually a harder proposition for you than this. Because in this, if they say, work out the time, you've only got one formula. You just plug your numbers in and you get the number out, right? You've got seven formulas which you need to decipher and then you reach part of the time. Exactly. So you've got a lot of choice to make in projectiles, whereas the Einstein stuff, conceptually, it's a lot harder, and we only brush the surface of it. But in terms of the stuff you need to do... No. No, no. No, I'll cover all the space topics. This is the answer. This is the answer. This is the answer. This is the answer. Anyway, what this essentially means, guys, is that we have covered the space topic. So we can tick that off and move on then to, um, to yeah, majors and generators. All right. that's, all you, all that's all you need to know for Einstein. It covers a, a bit of space in the syllabus, but you only require a really basic understanding, Cody. The website, if you go to Google and type in Einstein Light, it's one word, it will come up. It's the University of New South Wales Einstein Light site. Also, if you go to Moodle, yeah, if you're, if you're in Moodle and you go down to the um, Einstein dot point, there's a web link there, you just click on that and it'll bring it up too. So it's easily accessible. Okay, what have we got? We've got about six minutes left, haven't we? So you guys, um, we've got about six minutes left. Would you like me to just do these last few notes? Just so we have them. I think six minutes is worth doing some work with. Or should I do one more question? Uh, I, I don't really want to do notes right before. Okay, one more question? Yep. Okay, that's fair enough. I've just got to go back into... So, Cody, you're asking... If you go down to Space Main Idea 4 on Moodle... There... And... The Guide to Special Relativity... That's the, that's the site. Let's do a mass dilation question. 
So there's the formula for mass. This actually talks about rest mass. True bearings, that's not difficult. You're talking about partial differentiations. Yeah. Yeah. They're dead easy. I don't know what. Well, it's all you're doing is deriving. You're just doing derivative on one term instead of. That's just using triple. No, not really. Basically, if you've got a curve, here's the x-axis, and you have these two bounds, and you rotate it around the x-axis and find the volume of the side. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... We have to remember what the most common number. Most common number. Some people find out. What's the range? Range. Highest minus lowest. Right. 